Welcome to Super Talk Outdoors, where we celebrate every single Monday at lunchtime the world class outdoors of the state of Mississippi because we are in the capital of the outdoors in America from right here in the Foundation Studio on Biloxi's Back Bay. I want to thank you for joining us on the powerful Super Talk Mississippi radio network or on Super Talk TV at Seaspire TV. But some of you are watching on YouTube or Facebook or listening on your favorite podcast. It's May the 22nd. 2023. I want to especially thank the foundation, the title sponsor of Super Talk Outdoors. They're focused on important issues about protecting Mississippi's wildlife heritage. We really appreciate that. By the way, the views on this show are mine, not those of the foundation. And and uh, as I say every week, you can count on me to say what needs to be said when it comes to conservation issues in this state. And I'm super, super honored to be here. Um, hey, listen, I want to move over to my producer, Cal Curley. We don't chat enough on Super Talk Outdoors, and I just wanted to, to uh, say good morning to him and see how he's doing and uh, have a quick chat with him before we move to our first guest. How you doing, my friend? I'm doing pretty good. How about yourself? I'm doing really good, man. You doing fun, anything fun in the outdoors? Been uh, mostly baseballing lately. We've not had a chance. My son and I talked about it this weekend about trying to go fishing we thought we were going to get to go yesterday morning, but it did, just didn't pan out. Everyone had different plans, and everybody's going 100 miles an hour in different directions. So we're maybe in the next, I don't know, couple of weeks, we we got his travel ball baseball schedule uh, the, over the weekend. So it looks pretty busy through the end of July. <laughs> Well, look, you know, look, there are a lot of people listening to this show right now that have either been in your position or in your position right now. And, uh, you know, you got your priorities right. Your, your son's enjoying baseball. He's really a good baseball player. But I know how much he loves to fish, too. So you'll you'll find your little opening and get out and enjoy it with him. Oh, yeah. I think if, even if on some of the travel weekends, we'll just bring our fishing poles and find a window that we can go wherever we're at, whether because uh, we're playing – Anywhere between Lafayette and Birmingham, so <laughs> there's going to be a place to fish if we have time. Yeah, I, 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 I know that. Hey, we went out this weekend, and my observation from my son Jordan was, even though it's you know getting toward the end of May now, uh, the water offshore, we went about 60 miles offshore and did some mangrove fishing. Had, man, we had just had an amazing fishing day. But slick, calm. It was raining torrentially when we left. It was raining torrentially when we came back. But <clears throat> all the time, my shore was just beautiful. But what what the observation was is, it's been so warm. The water, it's like summertime out there right now. It's 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 already in that summertime mode. So, and fishing along the coast has gotten that way too. I bet you're hearing reports of that. Yeah, so far the fishing's been pretty good along the piers and stuff that we would have access to easily here um i really looking forward to moses pier once we get chance to go uh, fishing should be unbelievable right there yeah i know i know you love that one of the beautiful things about coastal mississippi is we have so many so many great piers you know stretching all across coastal mississippi and um you don't have to have a boat to have great fishing here in in, in coastal mississippi and uh cow's cow you know, it's fun fun because he gets these little windows and he can go out with his son and take advantage of that. And then, you know, you've got work to do. He's He's got his school work and other stuff to do. But you find those openings. And when you post those beautiful videos for us, uh, you can tell you're in, you're in heaven when you're doing it, aren't you? Yeah, I sent him one a week and a half ago was at lunch and was at Long Beach Harbor and took some great videos. And I sent it to him during school just to mess with his head. <laughs> well, look, uh, thanks, thanks, my friend, for what you do for the show. I appreciate you. You bet. Not a problem. My pleasure. Yeah. Cal Curley, the producer of Super Talk Outdoors. Hey, listen, uh, I'm thrilled to have Ryan Jones back. He's a fisheries biologist. He's originally from Brandon. He's been on the show before. We have we've had terrific visits. We're going to we're going to talk about a number of things, but we'll just catch up. How you doing, Ryan? Doing well. How about yourself, Rick? I'm doing good. So where are you coming to us t today? I'm at headquarters. You're at headquarters. Good yes, for you, sir. man. Hey, listen, I was thinking about you the other day. We've got a place up in Shula, and um, I, 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 at least three different farms, Shula, Minner City, and then in, in the basic Itabina area. And the main the main lodge for our little family hunting club is in, is, uh, in Itabina. And it's on a beautiful lake, man. I mean, it's just an absolutely beautiful lake. But this time of year, man, the, the vegetation starts to grow, and you almost can't even see the water. You hear that a lot, don't you? 
<clears throat> Are you talking about Roebuck? Yes. Roebuck. Uh, yeah, there's been a lot of water hyacinth on Lake Roebuck for a long time. We're actually working on um, reducing populations of, of water hyacinth on Horseshoe Lake right now near Chula. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, they're, we're, we're trying to basically use booms to like create different zones that we treat in. And um, because that water hyacinth just moves around and so much of it and it grows so fast, uh, you know, that if you don't treat it very aggressive and isolate the populations, you can't really deal with them. So, uh, you know, we're trying to have a new approach to managing it because it is a, a very difficult plant. Yeah, I've not heard I've not heard uh, the idea of, of booming it before like that. That's that. So you can you can what follow happens it. Is you go to spray it, you know, and you spray a lot and then the wind picks up, moves it around. And next time you come to spray, it's like a mosaic of sprayed and unsprayed vegetation. And so if you don't isolate the populations and treat within different zones, it's some it's pretty much can, impossible. You know? Can you defeat it? I think so. It's just you have to be, you know, you have to stay on it, you know. And, and like I said, when you do have success, you have to put a boom in there to keep that success so it doesn't just blow it around. You know, um, you have to you know, get get one area clear, boom it off, and then move into another area. You know what I'm saying? That's what we're that's what we're gonna try to move toward. Hey, so for people who have not heard us talk before, t tell them what your position is at the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks, and what it is you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, okay. Well, uh, I was Central Region Bio for the last 10 years. Uh, last August, I just took a coordinator position here at headquarters. Um, I'm responsible for coordinating the technical staff statewide, so the regional fisheries biologists and the hatchery managers. And so, you know, as you can imagine, there's just a lot of day-to-day -day things that are going to happen uh, that we got to try to, you know, help uh, help the staff uh, figure out and, and uh, you know, just knock out tabs here to here, you know, putting out fires left and right, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the last time we talked, you just sort of moved into that position. Uh, how's it going for you? It's good. It's good. You know, it's a lot. I feel like Sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm drinking from a fire hose, uh, but that's okay. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get used to it. Uh, working on uh, learning learning how to do federal aid as well. So kind of uh, working on that aspect as well. I just got a lot of irons in the fire. Uh, yeah. We're, we're kind of looking at right now, investigating the Lake Washington fishery, you know, so I'm heavily involved in, in kind of looking at every aspect of, of, of that fishery right now um, as we continue to sample and, and investigate what's going on with that crappie population. Yeah. Hey, so we'll, we'll actually come back to that here in just a second. When you think about your technical staff that you've got spread across the state, what 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 is what? Give me give me the makeup of that staff. Yeah. So we have five regions. Uh, you know, northeast that has state lakes, uh, part lakes, and uh, Pickwick and Tin Tom. You know, and then we got Northwest has a flow control reservoirs. Uh, so they they a lot of obviously Keith Mills. He does a great job. Uh, with those reservoirs, uh, and then we have a delta region uh, where we do a lot of the plant management, you know, and it's more made up of delta oxbow lakes, you know, management of those. Uh, and then you have the central region, which is a large region, uh, goes from Vicksburg over to Meridian and has state lakes, state park lakes, oxbows, rivers, streams, reservoirs. It has all, you know, uh, and then a coastal region uh, has a lot of coastal river uh, rivers and, and some state lakes and park lakes and that sort of thing. So that's kind of how we're spread out uh, in five different regions. So I can only imagine when you think about the different kinds of water um, sources that you're dealing with, or, and whether it's lake or oxbows or, you know, rivers or whatever, the, the, the biologists that report to you have a wide range of, of technical capabilities. That's right. That's right. Well, and each of these environments are, are different. You know, uh, fisheries are are uh, kind of affected by different um, factors, you know, in each type of fishery. So uh, I, I think regional biologists kind of get used to the reason how they, how they manage their type of, of fishery, you know. Mm -hmm. Hey, so when you talk about, we, we mentioned uh, just one example of aquatic vegetation control, but Give me an idea of the kind of efforts you guys are involved in around the state. Uh, so in the Delta region, 
it's mostly that water hyacinth issues, uh, uh, water hyacinth alligator weed, is what we deal with. But outside of that, um, we do, uh, we have an interlocal <clears throat> cooperative agreement with Pearl River Valley Water Supply District. Hey, hey let's do this. Let's do this, uh, Ryan. When we get on the other side, we'll talk more about this vegetation control a effort that you're on and, and uh, whatever else is on your mind. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation with Ryan Jones from the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. We'll see you after this. I said three Mississippi to this land called home. I breathe Mississippi till I'm dead and gone. Just carry on. I'll carry on. Mississippi. conversation on Mississippi's outdoors. It's Super Talk Outdoors with Ricky Matthews on Super Talk Mississippi. Mississippi. Welcome back to Super Talk Outdoors. I have my friend Ryan Jones from the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries and Parks. And uh, you know, he, in 2018, he was the fisheries biologist of the year for the department. So always good to kind of point that out. Uh, so, Ryan, let's come back to uh, this this vegetation issue that you face. Why don't you, why don't you finish telling me more about that? Uh, yeah, so you're talking about what we do statewide. To, to uh, control, yes. Uh -huh. So each, each regional bio has his own kind of plant management plan for, for the lakes that he manages, so he or she manages. And and um, and so they're, whatever they're planning on treating – uh, they'll prepare for that type of treatment the previous year and and uh, utilize those types of herbicides, you know, for whatever their case is, for their state lake, state park lake, or public water body that they have to deal with. So it's different annually um, what everybody's going to treat, but we do uh, have a uh, interlocal agreement with, with uh, Pearl River Valley Water Supply District to uh, manage the uh, plant community on Ross Barnett Reservoir. Uh, which is a full-time job. Uh, and so basically we just treat exotic invasive plants um, out there and try to try to manage four native species out on Ross Point Reservoir. So and there's been a lot of, uh, you know, back in 2020, we had uh, some really high water that blew a lot of tubers and seas and stuff into deeper water or buried them one or the other. And a lot of the lily pads, a lot of the American lotus, uh, that was out there really got buried uh, in that high water in 2020. And, and um, you know, it's coming back, but it's like slow, you know, but a lot of people think that our herbicide treatments on Ross Burnett Reservoir were, result, have resulted in that, you know, but that's certainly not the case. There's a lot of, a lot of pad fields um, that were there that we've never treated anything in that are just gone, you know, and, and we, we do plant surveys every year and it kind of shows uh, how we're doing, you know, uh, the percent coverage, percent uh, composition of different exotic species. We kind of monitor them every year, uh, but lotus has always been kind of right there around 25 to 30 percent, and after 2020, it really dropped. I mean, it was like eight percent, uh, and then this last year it was back back to like 15 percent. So it's kind of coming back, you know. Uh, but these are the types of things that we do. We we monitor the vegetation uh, and uh, along with, along with treatments. So, yeah. So I, I had a friend, of, I have a friend of mine who has had a lake for many years that he's really worked hard to, to manage properly. And what I, what I've heard from him and you guys uh, apparently do a really good job of this. And that is consulting with private owners, private landowners who have, who have lakes or ponds or whatever uh, to, to manage it, to optimize uh, for bass or whatever. Um, this is this is a really good service you guys offer there, isn't it? Yes, sir. We we provide technical guidance uh, to private private landowners. Um, basically, we we try to figure out what their goals are. We let them know how realistic it is, and and then provide them, you know, with a framework of how to get there uh, if they want to. You know, depending on their goal and. Uh, what kind of property they have, and that sort of thing. So, so what's tell me, talk to, talk me through the process. So, if I'm a, if I own a, a lake, and you guys came in, what's the first thing we would do? Take, kind of take me through that process. Okay. First thing I want to know is how, how big, you know, how many acres you got. Uh, say, if we were having a phone consultation, I want to know how, 
how big a water body you have, and then what your goals are, you know. And then I want to know about what you, what have you stocked it with, if you never stocked it and you just kind of – a lot of people call it because they just bought a property, you know. Uh, and so the first thing we want you to do is go fish it, you know, and then tell us what kind of fish, you know, you call it, what size is a bass and brim. And 90% of the time we can kind of hear that information and give you – guidance pushing forward but 90 percent of the ponds are bass crowded because people don't harvest fish anymore you know and naturally the bass will just overcrowd and they'll start they'll get a lot of small a lot of small bass that you so normally you would want to remove 10 15 pounds per acre annually uh, a small bass you know bass 13 inches and below or 14 inches and below uh, somewhere around there you know uh, harvest some of your smaller predators uh, it provides a, a little bit more forage uh, for those remaining each year and they're able to grow faster. Well, cool. So, um, and you've had a lot of success working with, 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 uh, private property owners across the state who have sung your praises for many years, haven't you? Oh yeah. We, we, I mean, in central region, we, we used to do a lot, a lot of, uh, a lot of pond checks. I mean, that, it, it kind of, that's the first thing you do on a Monday morning, come in and, and, and get, get your pond your paws knocked out because uh, it was always a list. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Hey, listen, uh, I don't know if we've talked since uh, since the deer season. Did you have a good deer season of hunting? Oh man, uh, to be honest, I I was uh, busy with the youngins. I, I was doing baseball uh, like 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 he was, man. <laughs> like cow, yeah. Yeah, baseball and soccer, <clears throat> chasing these youngins around. I got three boys, and and uh, they keep me on the on the ball field. So. Yeah, well, man, we, we've 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 definitely all been there for sure. Hey, so there was a note here about about hand grabbing. I'm assuming that's noodling. Uh, that, that's a popular that's popular in this state, isn't it? Yeah, it is popular. Uh, you know, a lot of people. I I don't do it as much as I used to, uh, but yeah, it, it's it's a it's a thrill for sure. To go on and eat that water and, and and put your hand in a in a box and, and get, uh, get, get, get. Hey, so for people <laughs> who don't know about noodling and and haven't been talk, talk us through it you know t tell us the process and the bravery and courage that's required well i mean you're kind of waiting around out there um you know people do it different there's some if you if you were to go to a natural box bow or something in the delta people people be uh kind of trying to grab at a at a holes and cavities on the shoreline uh but a lot of the stuff like on barnett you got a lot of boxes and, and stuff that people put out for cavities, spawning cavities for these catfish. So, and that's what they're trying to do. They're in these these boxes or cavities trying to spawn. And when you stick your hand in there, they're protecting uh, the nest. Uh, so uh, basically <laughs> you go down there blind. Typically what you would do is, is stick your foot in there, you know, and, and see if anything's there. And, 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 um, and you'll find out pretty quick. <laughs> and, uh, and once you know, then you can go down there and be prepared. Take a big, big breath. Get down there and and uh, and you put your hand in there, and, and they're going, they're going to snap on it. Uh, and and uh, best thing to do is when you grab a hold of them, just flip them over, flip them over, and roll around on them like that, and pull them out. That's how you do it. Got to, you got to turn them upside down. <laughs> so, the, so there's a technique. There's a technique to when you get this uh, big catfish grasping hold of your arm. <laughs> Is, and you're underwater. They're powerful now. I mean, yeah, and they get a hold of your arm, and it's, I mean, you know, it's almost gets to a point of fight or flight sometimes. You know, you, you get out there, and, and that big jugger's got a hold of your hand. You got to come out with it, or somebody's, somebody, something's got to give. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So it's a, how, it's a how heavy is, is the box anchored? Yeah, well, a lot of times people, um, <laughs> People use rip wrap or whatever it is to keep keep box down to get it, get it um, uh, good and submerged there, um, and and it'll eventually lock water log. You know, uh, uh, I, I never put any boxes out personally. I don't have any boxes out on Barnett or anything like that, uh, so I've never even built one. But uh, I've just been been a little bit and it is uh flatheads are the best See, the flatheads they're gonna they're gonna try to eat your eat your arm like swallow it <laughs> whole, you know? whereas the uh the blue cat just wants to really crush he, he grab a blue cat's gonna grab a hold of your hand and try to crush 
the bones in that jugger. So it's better <laughs> actually to get get a flathead because the flathead goes all the way into your elbow just about, and then you can just turn them over and pull them out. Whereas that blue wants wants, wants to hurt you. <laughs> well, look, if somebody's just driving through Mississippi listening to this show, Cal, <laughs> do you want your arm eaten or your hand crushed? Which one do you want? I, I don't want any part of it. Uh, <laughs> hey, Kyle, you need to go one time. You just need to go one time. No, I'm good. <laughs> I, no, I'm good. <laughs> People hear, the, hear this. Say, okay, the, the, these folks are getting underneath the water, stick, sticking their foot in the box to see if something's there. And then if something's there, then they're just feeding their arm and hand to these. How? I mean, some of these catfish. 25, you, 25 50, 60. You know, I mean, yeah, I mean, big fish, you know. Well, I like that. Do you, you just want to, you know, you, you have, have you, have you, does it hurt? Honestly, does it hurt? And do you know people that's been injured? The injuries occur because there's a lot of old stuff out there uh, that that's you can't, that's illegal to put out like old, old hot water heaters and that sort of stuff. And people are walking around out there, uh, and they and they get they step on it or they kick it or something like that or uh you know you need to wear gloves when when you hand grab you need to wear some gloves yeah. you need to wear a sleeve yeah uh because if you do get a hold of something in there and and it's real if there's any sharp edges on the box that you're trying to reach in i mean i mean you can slice your arm open you know i mean it's uh you do have to be careful for that too <laughs> well, I, I, that'd be a good headline for this show. Do you want your hand crushed or your arm eaten? You know, let's, 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 associated with hand grabbing. Uh, yeah, let let, let let Ryan tell you what your choice <laughs> is. <laughs> hey, listen, this has been a fun conversation, my friend. It's been great to catch up with you. Yeah, you too. You have a great day. We'll see you after this break. Appreciate it. Welcome back to Super Talk Outdoors. I really enjoyed that conversation with Ryan. Now let's shift gears and move over to my friend, Captain Brent Madden. And Brent's, uh, we've been on the show before. He's over the Mississippi Conservation Officers Training Academy. He's actually at the academy now, and we'll get the latest from him. But how you doing, Brent? I'm good, sir. How are you? I'm doing well. So describe where you're coming to us from today. I'm actually inside the cadet barracks right now. Um, if you'll notice, about half the bunks are made up and half aren't. Uh, the cadets left last Wednesday to um, to start Malota yesterday morning, which is the police academy at Pearl. Hey, so let's let's for people who don't know about the Conservation Officers Training Academy and haven't haven't uh, heard you and me talk about it before, we'll come back to the 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 requirements of a conservation officer and how do you apply in the process and all that but talk to me specifically about the process once someone has been a you know been hired as a conservation officer go take take us through the process so <clears throat> once they're hired as a conservation officer they'll start our academy um we try to line it up to where it's eight to eight to ten weeks before police academy starts so they'll show up at our academy um that we'll we'll line them up for success to to be fully prepared for um for the police academy at pearl uh, once they get done here uh they'll go to to pearl police academy academy Malota for about 12 weeks uh, 11 or 12 weeks then they'll come back to us for the remaining of the 12 13 weeks um that they didn't complete uh on the on the front end once they get done with that we'll put them in the field with a field training officer for three months at the end of those three months, we put them with another field training officer for an additional three months, which total six months. Then they will be under uh, direct, I say direct, indirect supervision of their their field supervisor for six more months. And I'll, I'll assign them classes along and along to do so. Roughly, it's about 18 months of training. Wow, that's that's incredible. So, like, as, as we said, he's got bunks behind him. How long do, do they actually stay at that facility? Yes, sir. They, all, they usually report on Sundays, um, usually around uh, 3 to 5 o'clock in the afternoon, Sunday afternoons, and they won't leave until Thursday afternoon. So they, they stay here the whole time. 
Wow, that's incredible. So it's really intense. I mean, you're going, and over the years, as we've described last year, last time we talked, over the years has been refined and there's a lot more to learn than it, than there used to be. I think one of the points you used to make is, is uh, give them a little bit of instruction and turn them loose. It's not like that anymore, is it? No, sir. It's especially this day and time where accountability um, is everything. Now we we want to we want to know that that we've provided them with with all the tools and training uh, needed, and and then some. Um, before they're completely on their own, because like I said, accountability and integrity is the most important thing in, in today's law enforcement field. You know what's interesting, uh, Brandon? Most people can probably relate to this. If you if you turn on any any cable network these days, and you just kind of run the channels, you're gonna you're gonna come across some of those uh, reality programs that are involving. Uh, conservation officers from Texas or Alaska or Montana. I mean, they're, 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 actually, it turned out that that probably is a very popular show. But what's interesting about about watching a conservation officer in, in action is they face such a wide variety of situations. And and what what really comes to mind is how calm they are and how 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 are they're working to sort of. Uh, deflate the situation, whatever it might be, and kind of handle it to the best of their ability so that things don't get, don't turn south on them. Um, that takes a lot of psychology training, really. I mean, you, you've really, I bet you guys do a lot of role playing and, and so on. I mean, you've got to have, somebody's got to be well skilled to, to handle situations like that. Right. We do, we do a lot of scenarios, uh, probably to the point where they get tired of doing uh, scenarios. We'll call other officers in to, to act as role players. But, you know, from day one, we, you know, we, we preach to them accountability and, and responsibility, things of that nature. But, um, you know, you, you can't train too much. Um, you know, you, you go a little bit at a time, but every training we try to build on it. Um, you know, we may start at something as, as simple as checking a fishing license from a bank fisherman. And then it develops into, well, they had, they had a gun in their tackle box. How are you gonna approach that? Most people have guns. But the end result is we, te we teach our cadets that 99.9% .9 of the folks that they're dealing with are either trying to put meat in the freezer or have a good time or both. It's the 0.01% that, that'll get you in trouble. Um, yeah. and, of course, you know, you always hear complacency kills. Our biggest thing is teaching our officers not to be complacent. Always expect the unexpected, but treat people as you would treat your grandmother until they they choose to, you know, turn the roles in the situation. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it can be a delicate balance. Um, currently, the goal right now is to have, is it essentially two conservation officers per county? Is that is that what the goal is? To yes, sir. Our goal is, is to try our best to have at least two in each county. Um, you know, some counties only have one. Other counties don't have any. And anyway, we have to call on officers from other counties. Um, some counties need three. I'm from Scott County. We used to have three in Scott County because we have over 100,000 acres of public land uh, in Scott County. And there's, there's plenty of other counties in the state um, that just like Madison County has so much water in it. Uh, Rankin County, you could easily put three in those counties. Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's it's amazing to me what they have. So if, a, if an officer is um, it encounters something that does, is not going well, mm -hmm. is the backup uh, the other conservation officer, or is it like the the county sheriff's department or police department and highway patrol? How does that work? Well, it it usually depends on the situation. If we're on the water on the river. Um, Usually there there's others uh, working working the water at the same time we are they just may be in a different boat, um, but if it's out in the woods a lot of times we're by ourselves. Usually it's going to be the the local sheriff's department. Yeah, yeah, that's a man. That's why it's important not to try to keep something from getting escalated. I mean that's, that's right. well another thing to think of is you know. Somebody that's been working the county or the highways, it's easy to find a location along a, a county road or a highway, but 
hardly ever we're going to stay in our trucks. We may be a mile in the woods. And then, then that's when the real searching and work starts is once you get out of that truck and start looking for that officer to get in there to back him up. Hey, so, so, so Brent, one of the things I'm curious about is that's a lot of training, a lot of huge commitment. What's your level of attrition once you get started? Usually within the first, well, let me back up. Usually the first three weeks, if somebody's going to quit the academy, it's going to be within the first three weeks. Yeah. Now, you, you're always open to injury, things of that nature, and losing somebody. But typically, if a cadet stays the first three weeks, and we tell them this on the front end, give us three weeks. But three weeks is is the key time frame on being able to keep somebody within the training. After training usually within the first three to five years, you've lost 25 to 30% of the class. Wow. And and they might go to be a law enforcement officer somewhere else, or, right. you know, maybe going back to school. There were probably a number of different reasons for that, but um, you, you've really worked hard. I, I, one of the, one of the things we talked about before is the, the hiring process is intense. You guys are really focused on, you know, it's again, you're, you're before it was, Give them some good instructions and let them go. But today, because of what you're having to, what they're having to prepare for, it's so many different scenarios. Like you and I were talking about a few minutes ago, um, the reality is that you've got to you've got to really, really work hard to make sure you're hiring the best and brightest among the group. And and it's something you guys really focus on, isn't it? It, it is, and we take pride in it. Usually, when we um... When we drop a group off at, at Police Academy per se, they, they always brag about our hiring process because it's, you know, they, they're always our caliber of cadets or recruits that they, they really brag on that. We don't we don't drop off any iffy folks, if you will. It's when when we drop them off there, we we're 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 vetting them. We're putting our name on them. Hey, these are our folks. Yeah, so it's interesting. You, you you actually were a conservation officer for like 17 years, right? Yes. Sir. 17 years. Yes, sir. I've been years. on since 05, and of course things have, have changed a lot since then, the laws and everything else. But um, but it's still still my dream job. I wouldn't I wouldn't have any other job. I can see I can see that, man. I can see that you love what you're doing. You're you're trying to to uh, share that passion with others. And it was seen to me, look, here's the thing. I haven't met a, a conservation officer. I'm sure there are probably some bad apples in the group somewhere, <laughs> but I haven't met one that wasn't really, really attentive and smart and kind and, I mean, just great at what they did. I, I mean, I mean the, the crop of, of conservation officers you guys have right now are absolutely terrific. At least my experience has been that. Hey, when we come back on the other side, we'll continue our conversation with Captain Brent Madden. He's over the Mississippi Conservation Officers Training Academy. We actually want to talk a little bit more about if you're if you're interested in this job or you know someone who might be interested in it. We'll talk about how the how to apply and what the what the hiring process looks like, like and uh, talk a little bit more about how often they do the training academy and so on. So we'll see you after this break with more from Brent Madden. We live in one of the best places in America to enjoy the outdoors. So let's talk about it. It's Super Talk Outdoors with Ricky Matthews on Super Talk Mississippi. Welcome back to Super Talk Outdoors for the final segment. I have my friend Captain Brent Madden, who's head of the Mississippi Conservation Officers Training Academy. And uh, I enjoy visiting with you, Brent, because I can tell you're passionate about what you're doing. And you, you got to take it seriously because you, you don't want, with all the new laws and requirements and you, the point you made at this notion the, you, that you made around accountability, you don't want to let anyone out there who's not ready for just about any potential scenario. And you take that very seriously, don't you? Yes, sir, I do. And we, going back to the FTO program that we have, you know, with if they get to the end of that first three months and, and that FTO feels like, no, they're not quite ready to go to this 
second phase. We'll keep them on there a few more weeks before we release them into the next phase. And then it's the same way with the next phase. And then when they fall under the lieutenant in the training phase and then the final evaluation, everything, they're held accountable for their own actions and um, and their own training. But, but yes, it, it all comes back to training. Uh, yeah. If somebody, you know, if somebody gets sued for for actions, that's that's one of the things they look at is was the officer properly trained? Yeah, yeah, and I know you guys are doing everything in your power to make sure that one comes back as a big time yes for sure. Yes, so, if someone's interested in being a conservation officer, what would your advice be? Well, obviously, they got to be at least twenty one years old. Um, a lot of the career days and things of that nature that we go to, you know the the, the high school juniors and seniors, they think, man, 21 will never get here. I might as well do something else. Well, for this job, you got to have at least a, a, a two-year degree, an associate's degree, or 64 college hours, which that would put you close to 20 years old by the time you get done with that if you graduate at 18. Um, I, me personally, I encourage folks to either get a, to, to uh, get their degree in this, go on to another co uh, four-year university, get their bachelor's degree, um, but I'll also encourage them to go to, a, if they're dead set on just getting a two-year degree, I, I tell them to go to a local junior college or, or, or whatever's best for them and learn a trade. Um, there's a high demand for manual labor uh, right now, and, you know, that would help them out in the long run. But at the end of it, they got to have at least 64 college hours or an associate's degree. If they don't have any college, the only other option is if they were already in law enforcement. They've been to police academy. Um, they've only got to have now is, is the requirement is only two years of experience where it used to be five years. And so, that'll take a big July 1st. Yeah, so, so okay, so someone's interested. What, what would they expect to see as they go through the hiring process? It's a lengthy process. You know, anything dealing with, with state or federal government is, is going to be a longer process uh, than just going to – you know, a, a local hardware store or, or a factory, wherever they may go get a job and they sit down with a boss and shake hands and, you know, they smile a little bit and look them in the eyes. It's, it's a lot more to that. Uh, so what we do is we'll, we'll post it on our website and advertise for it. And they will, they will actually click a link on our website and it'll redirect them to the state personnel board and then fill out the application. At the end of that window, usually it's a 30-day window, State Personnel Board will send us all the applications. We don't, we don't get the applications right when they fill it out. We get it at the end of the 30 days. Once we get those, we go through and make sure they're qualified, and then we actually send out our job applications to them through email. Once they send those back, uh, we will set them up for a PT test and a swim test, and then we'll set up the interview process after that. So there, there's about four different, five different steps in our hiring process. Once they get to, through the first interview, we'll even do a background check on them, a thorough background check. The, the local county officer actually go to their house and interview them and um, go and talk to their former employees, employers and things of that nature. So it's a it's a very lengthy process that obviously doesn't, doesn't happen overnight, but I'll give you a, uh, instance, normally we will, out of 30 days, normally we'll get around 250 applications sent in state personnel board. Once I vet those and see who's qualified and who's not, that usually narrows it down to about 175 folks. Once I send out emails, out of those 175, we only usually get 50 or 60 packets back. Um, once we have the PT test, we'll usually lose five or six at the PT test. So generally, we'll interview 50 people, first round interviews, and then we, we drop, drop it down to about 25 the next round. And then we try to hire 15 to 20 out of that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> when you say PT test, you're talking about it's a physical test? Yes, sir. They'll do a mile and a half run. They'll do two minutes of push-ups. They'll do an agility run, and after all that's over, we'll jump across town, and they'll do a swimming test, which there's nothing to it. They just swim from one side of the pool to the other, or one end of the pool to the other. They can dog paddle. They can float on their back. We just need to know that, you know, they can keep their selves up for, for a few seconds on top of water. Yeah, that that's uh, that's good. Listen, uh, I... 
this is you know the, the Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks is a first-class organization with so many dedicated employees. And if someone wants to give back to conservation the way that so many of the people that I have the opportunity to talk to here on Super Talk Outdoors are doing, this would be the great a great job for the right person who really enjoys the outdoors and wants to make contribute back to Mississippi. Hey, uh, Captain Brent Madden, it's been a pleasure to catch up with you, my friend. Yes, sir. I enjoyed it. Keep up the good work. Uh, listen, have a have a great week. As I always say, stay safe in the outdoors. Just always put safety first. Have a great week. God bless you, and we'll see you next Monday.